pandemic. So please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. And it's my great pleasure to be here today to share some of the latest research on the efficient 3D perception for autonomous vehicles. So we'll have a QA session at the end of the lecture. So please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions like uh, along the lecture. So all right, so today's lecture will be centered around the three keywords in the title: efficient 3D perception and autonomous vehicles. So before diving into the technical parts of the lecture. So I would like to first spend like 10 minutes on explaining the three concepts. So what are the autonomous vehicles and what is 3D perception and why do we care about this efficiency? So let's first talk about autonomous vehicles. So I guess all of Doesn't you are very familiar with this concept as you are taking this course, right? But I would like, still like to take a moment to quickly overview how the autonomous vehicles work. So as you can see from this video, the autonomous system actually can drive the car very smoothly in this fairly complicated scenario. There are a lot of things happening, like mm -hmm. in the electric like, sure, It needs to recognize a lot of the cars in this very crowded parking lot. It also needs to understand the behavior of other humans and other cars in order to like uh, react properly. For example, you can see like here, it has to pull over for incoming traffic. That's actually not as easy. But the question is how it works. So this is the autonomy track developed by Neural. So I use it here as a example, but like different companies are taking more or less similar approaches. So the first component in the stack is sensors. So they're essentially the eyes of the cars, like um, gathering the information about the surrounding uh, environment. There are a lot of different sensors mounted on the car. You can see here on top of the car, there are like 360 LiDAR and vision sense, uh, systems. And also there are radar sensors like all around the car and also their uh, parameter vision uh, system and the LiDAR system as well. So on the Waymo driver, there are in total uh, four LiDAR sensors, 10 camera sensors and six radar sensors. So that's a lot. These sensors can actually provide different kinds of information and the different sensors of the same kind can also provide a better coverage of the like, surrounding of the car. So after collecting the information from the sensors, the system then goes to the perception module. So here it has to understand like what's going on around the car, for example, to recognize all the other cars and people and understanding the layout of the scene. So it's actually a very challenging task because you can see, for example, here, there are a lot of moving cars that are actually very far away from the Eagle Park. And also it's very hard to recognize them because of the low light condition here. And that's your perception. The system moves forward to the prediction and the planning module. So based on how other objects have moved in the past few seconds, so the prediction module will like estimate uh, how they will move in the near future, let's say ten, like in the next 10 seconds. And it's actually also very challenging because the future can be uncertain. For example, like uh, very close to the like, intersection, the car can actually either uh, go straight or actually turn left or turn right. So the planning module has to take all these possibilities into consideration and then plan the move accordingly. Uh, in order to drive safely. And the final step is the control modules. So it basically takes the uh, plan trajectory uh, and maps it into the action by actually controlling the steering wheels and acceleration. So I hope this gives you a very quick glance of how autonomous vehicles work. So in this lecture, we'll be mainly focusing on the second component here, the perception. So we're more precisely, we'll be focusing on the three perception. So what is three perception? The input to the 3D perception is the sensory data. For example, here we have the multi-view camera images uh, from multi-view cameras here, and each heading different orientations, for example, some of them uh, heading uh, front and some of them heading back and left and right. We also have the light up point out here. So here I projected into the top-down bird's eye view for visualization purposes. So based on these inputs, the goal of the 3D perception is to understand the surrounding environment. For example, to do the 3D object detection to detect all the other objects uh, in the scene, such as the car, cars, uh, pedestrians here. So these detections have to happen in a 3D space because we care not only about these objects in where they are in the 2D images, also we want to understand how far away are they from the Eagle car. And in addition to detecting these dynamic objects, in some places where we don't have the high definition map, we also want to like, Pass the semantic layout based on the perception data. So that's called BAB map segmentation. So here we need to pass the tribal area, 
the link divider and the other like semantic pulses as well. So how can we achieve the 3D perception? So nowadays, all the 3D perception systems are mostly based on like uh, neural networks, deep learning. So I will first uh, briefly go over two of the very um, classic 3D perception models. One is a camera-based models, one is a LIDAR-based models. So first, let's take a look at uh, the camera-based 3D perception model here. It's called FTON3D. So you can see the overall structure is actually very similar to the uh, 2D detect detection models. For example, we have the image backbones at the very beginning, and then we have the feature pyramid network to extract the multi-scale features to cover objects with different sizes. The major difference here with the, uh, from the 2D detection is actually at the hat. You can see here, we not only care about the 2D offset, the 2D locations of the car, we also want to regress the depths uh, the 3D dimensions of the box and also like the orientations and finally the velocity. So velocity is actually very important because it's used in the motion prediction stage to help uh, the system understand like the movement of the car. And then it's the, uh, this is the LIDAR based 3D perception model. It's called point pillars. I think it's actually covered uh, in the previous lecture. So, uh, so most of the 3D perception model follows basically the same paradigm. So it will first use a 3D encoder here to extract uh, the 3D features. And then it will project uh, the 3D features onto the bird's eye view, a 2D uh, map. So uh, by the way here, the 3D encoder we are using is very similar to a point map. Uh, it's less powerful than the sparse convolutional models I will introduce uh, later, uh, but it's actually like more friendly for the deployment. So they can be easily deployed using TensorRT other acceleration libraries. And then for the BAB feature map, as, because this is in 2D, so you can use any 2D platforms and detection has to process it. For example, here, they're using a multi-scale backbone and also using SSP as their detection path. So with the development of the like, deep learning and neural networks, we have actually observed a huge improvement in accuracy of the 3D perception model. So here, I, uh, is the trend of the 3D detection score from the new things uh, leaderboard. You can see that um, the very first method here actually is point pillars that we just introduced. It only achieves around 45% like uh, new things detection score. But over the past four years, the detection accuracy has improved from 45% to above 75% here. So that's a 30% absolute improvement. We are also witnessing more and more methods on the like coming on each week actually on the leaderboard. It's a very fast evolving direction. However, the improved accuracy comes at the cost of the increased computation as well. So on the left hand side, we have the latest YOLO V8 series. So that's a very uh, popular uh, efficient 2D detection models targeting real time deployment. So you can see they're actually very efficient. While on the right hand side, I listed a few representative 3D detection models. Uh, in the chronological order, for example, the point painting FCOS and the latest like uh, transfusion and filter 3D. So we can see a clear gap in the computation between the 2D and 3D detectors here. The 2D detectors consume around like 200 uh, G max, while for some uh, camera-based 3D detection models like EVDAT, they're actually taking like uh, the 3T maps max. So that's the uh, that raises a huge challenge for the on the efficiency side of the 3D detection models. So that comes to the third keyword in the uh, of this lecture, efficiency. So one reason why we care about the efficiency is also like the computers powering the self-driving cars could be a huge source of the carbon emission. So that's why we care about this efficiency. So this is the latest article from the MIT News. So a group of MIT researchers identified that the computers so if we have like 1 billion uh, autonomous vehicles and each drive, uh, drives for like one hour per day, and if it's mounted with a computer consuming like 840 watts of uh, like uh, energy, you can see its carbon emission is around the same as the data center currently do. So you can also see from the curves here. So because of this, the drive GPUs are actually usually more energy efficient than the server GPUs. For instance, a popular drive GPU here, the NVIDIA Jetson AGX Array, it consumes only 40 watts of energy. So it's around seven times lower than the server-side GPU, like uh, NVIDIA A100. But it also comes at a cost, right? So its peak performance is also weaker than the server-side GPU. For example, its peak performance 
is only 108 TOPS, while the server uh, GPU A100 is like six times more than that. So like the limited computational resources we have on the car also motivates us to design more efficient 3D perception algorithms. So that's actually the focus of this lecture. So for the rest of the lecture, I will start by introducing the BB Fusion. So it's a 3D perception framework that can efficiently support multiple sensors and handle multiple different 3D uh, perception tasks. And next, I will give you a brief overview of our latest works, Platformer and Sparse VIT. So they're accelerating the LiDAR and uh, camera encoders in the 3D perception models. And lastly, I will demonstrate how we have deployed our work in the autonomous racing vehicle and also on a full-scale autonomous car. So let's begin with the BB Fusion. As I had mentioned earlier, like self-driving cars are equipped with numerous sensors, each with distinct types and also distinct orientations. So the three most commonly used sensors are the LiDAR, camera, and radar. So we will first go over each one of them. So cameras are probably the most familiar sensors to all of us because we are using them on a daily basis. So they capture the dense RGB images in the, uh, in the 2D space which can capture rich semantic information, for example, the color and texture of the environment and the other cars. LIDARs, on the other hand, capture data in the form of a sparse 3D point cloud, which essentially is a set of points, X, Y, Z coordinates, and sometimes we also have some other features like intensities. So as the data is in 3D, the LIDARs can provide very accurate spatial information about the distance of each point to the eagle car, which can be crucial for the 3D detection task. And this type of sensor has also become more accessible in the past few years. For example, the, like the latest generations of the iPhone Pro actually has also equipped with the LiDAR scanners, which is uh, underneath the camera sensors. And finally, the radars are kind of similar to the LiDARs in some ways. They are also capturing the data in the sparse uh, point cloud format in the 3D or in the bird's eye view space. So there are two main differences between the LiDAR and radar data collected. The first one is the data collected is much sparser than the, than the LiDAR data, uh, point cloud. And also it's much noisier. And also another thing is that the radar is, can, can directly uh, measure the velocity of the other objects. That could be very like, useful if you're going to like, estimate the velocity of the other moving objects. So different sensors have distinct uh, properties. Some of them are like focusing on capturing the semantic information. Some of them are capturing like spatial information and some capturing motion cues. So using a variety of sensors can also improve the robustness of the bridge detection system. For example, the camera sensors are not very robust to lighting condition. You can see from, from this visualization here, during the nighttime, the camera sensor can barely provide much useful information. While during the daytime, the direct sunlight can also cause the overexposure which also makes it very challenging to, for the camera sensor to capture anything. LiDAR sensors, you can see on the bottom of the two visualizations are less effective to by the lighting condition. However, the LiDAR sensors are not very robust to, like, in some weather conditions. For example, here you can see in the rainy days, the LiDAR sensors will capture the water sprays in the beta as well, which might actually gen, uh, let, um, confuse the three perception systems and generate some false positive predictions. And the same applies to the fog, foggy days. We can see that the fog particles can also generate some uh, noise in the data. But in these two cases, the climate sensors are kind of less effective and radar is actually very robust to different weather conditions. So therefore, fusing information from diverse sensors can help us avoid a single point failure from a single sensor and make the 3D perception system more robust. So one of the significant challenge in the sensor fusion is the view dis uh, discrepancy. So that means different sensory data are in a different format in a different space. So for example, here we have the camera data. So they're in a perspective view and we have the LiDAR data is in a 3D view. And also you can see actually different camera data as they are having different orientations. So that means if you're considering the top left corner of each camera sensor, they are not actually corresponding to the same spatial location. In order to understand the, like the, the spatial relationship between different pixels across different camera sensors, we actually need to know how the cameras are mounted and using some calibration to, to, to understand the, like, the relationships. 
So that means we cannot like naively just adding these features together and fuse them together, right? Because they are not actually corresponding to the same spatial location. So the goal of the uh, multi-sensor fusion is actually to find a good uh, shared space to resolve the view discrepancy in view. So there are two requirements here. First, the sensor data needs to be easily converted to this, this space without much of the uh, loss of information. So here the conversion has to be implemented, can be implemented very efficiently and in a very easy manner. And also the information loss is another thing we need to consider because different sensors are giving us different uh, information. We want to preserve this information as much as possible. And the second requirement is this space has to be suitable for different 3D perception tasks. Because in reality, we care not only about a 3D object detection, we also care about some other semantic tasks like the max chain for so now let's take a look at a few existing solutions. So the first solution is called camera centric fusion. It's actually motivated by the RGB data, the RGBP data. So the basic idea is we can just project the light up point cloud onto the camera plane using the camera to light up the formation. And then you can see this is the sparse light up depth we'll get. It's kind of different from the light up depth, uh, the depth we'll get from the RGBP sensor because it's much sparser here. And after that, we can just concatenate them together and we can process it using like any uh, camera based uh, 3D detection models, for example, the SEO or 3D model I just mentioned. So, what's the problem of this uh, approach? So, let's take a closer look at the LIDAR that's projected um, to the camera thing. So, I circle out a few regions here. You can see that within each circle, right, there are clearly some points with like very different colors. So for some of the uh, points, it, uh, the depth is actually very small, and for some of them, actually have a very large depth. So there's a discontinuity in the depths converted. The reason for that is the projecting when we are projecting the line up point out, uh, to the camera point, the depth value of each pixel is actually determined by the closest to light up like uh, point to the pixel. Therefore, like neighboring pixels can have different depths as long as they are close to the closest to a different uh, line up. So this will result in a loss of information about the true 3D structure of the scene and the object, making it very hard to accurately detect and localize the 3D objects. And this could be an issue for the 3D detection task. So that's why actually most of the leading like uh, multi-sensor fusion 3D detection models don't really follow this approach. They are using a different approach called LIDAR centric fusion. So the idea is that we want to project the camera information to the LIDAR space. So here is a, a very representative work called point painting. It's actually from the same group as the point peelers. So the first step is to run the 2D semantic sanitation to get the semantic uh, labels for each uh, pixel. For example, here we have the cars, we have the cyclists here. And after that, we paint the semantic labels to the uh, light up point cloud. So it would be a color point cloud at, uh, afterwards. And then we can just use any light up detectors to process it. For example, we can use the point pillars, we can use like sparse cone, like point RCNN to process it. So what's the issue of this approach? So the camera to light up projection is actually very lossy in, like, in the semantics. So the camera and LiDAR feature, because the camera and LiDAR data have drastically different densities. So here you can see all these red dots are the LiDAR points projected onto the camera. Point. So only 5% of the camera features are actually covered by one of the LiDAR points. That means all the other points, as long as they're not like visualizing red here, they're actually dropped directly during the decoration, the painting process. This is actually not optimal because you can see like the, like the semantic uh, information is very important Important for some classes, for example, if you, are one, if you want to understand the layout of the thing, that's definitely a necessary information you need to use. And also another thing we can notice here is the top right corner of this image is fairly covered. So the reason for that is the LIDAR has a limited coverage uh, in the range, for example, like uh, plus minus like 50 meters. While a camera can actually capture objects that are very far away from the eagle part. So if you're doing the fusion in this manner, if we project the uh, camera uh, decorate the camera features to the LiDAR data, all these image features, camera features will be directly discarded. It's also not optimal. So now we have talked about the limitations of like both camera-centric fusion and the LiDAR-centric fusion. Oh, okay. Um, I just had a question. Uh, have you, uh, um, 
used or have you seen anything in the literature about using like intensity images or reflectivity images to do kind of these kinds of functions? So for, I'm also projecting a light as a camera. Sorry. So, so are you also projecting a lidar data to a camera using the intensity like the, the time? Yes, yes. This is actually very similar to like the camera centric fusion. So I haven't really seen a lot of papers doing that for the object detection specifically because the camera based detection model, uh, the accuracy actually lags far behind the lidar based detection. So most people have decided to like do that in the lidar space. But I think that's actually a very interesting idea because nowadays actually the camera based detection catch up in the accuracy a lot. So that approach could be like an uh, interesting direction. Yeah, so we have talked about the limitations of like uh, both uh, LiDAR centric fusion and camera centric fusion. So here comes the uh, first small quiz. So like what other options do we have, right? How can we fuse the information better? We have the camera, we have the LiDAR. Is there a better solution for the fusion? You could uh, object space. Object so space. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting idea. So some papers actually have explored that. So they use uh, some sort of latent object uh, theories, uh, and then like uh, they projected it onto either camera and lidar. That's actually a very interesting idea. It's actually very uh, effective in the in the detection three detection model. But if you think about it, if you're if we care about the map segmentation, that could be very challenging, right? If you only care about those objects using the object to purely the different sensors. Like in feature space. In a feature space. So what kind of feature space are you thinking about? So you have a um, feature extractor for the LiDAR and another feature extractor for the image, mm -hmm. and you directly use the output like the like a latent space for both. Mm -hmm. You directly use those numbers to, to um, as your combined feature. Uh, so that means that you have the camera features, LiDAR features, and then you do some spatial pooling or you if you just directly use the so you can you put two you concatenate the output from two different feature extractors. I see, I see. So you flatten the features of like uh, from different sensors yes. and then like use that as a fusion features. I think that could be an interesting idea. I think yeah, so, so some people will do like something more a little bit more complicated, bring some like pause attention between the hidden like the hidden features. That's actually a, a very interesting solution as well. Yeah. So actually, our approach is like uh, already in the in the name of the paper. It's called BV, right? So basically, we're choosing the first idea space. There are definitely other options, of course, like all these like object theory, like the feature space, latent space could be a good alternative as well. So the reason we choose this space is first, like most of the three D perception tasks can be supported in the first idea space because like they are uh, mostly like extracting features, attaching has in the first idea space. So let's take a look at how we can uh, transform the features to the first idea in a high level. So the line of features is actually very simple because it's already in the 3D space. Projecting to the first idea space, just discarding the Z axis, right? And you can see it's kind of preserving the geometric structure of the LiDAR because you can still see that this is a car, right? Even after projecting the height image. But in reality, we don't really discard the, directly discard the like uh, height dimension. We'll do some, like feature aggregation on the height dimension to embed it to the channel dimension. So in this way, the Z, uh, the information of the Z is kind of still like preserved. Well, the camera is a little bit more complicated. I will detail in the uh, next few slides. But the overall idea is we have like multiple cameras that are having different orientations. We want to project it onto uh, this shared bird's eye view space. Here like the um, uh, front camera, back camera, and the other cameras as well. So from this visualization, you can have a very intuitive sense that like it's also very dense in the semantically dense, so preserving the density of the camera features. So after all the features are captured in the bird's eye view, we can easily fuse them together using them uh, using some like animalized operation. So let's take a look at how we implement this. So given different sensory data, for example, we have the multi-view images, light up point cloud, the radar targets. Uh, we'll first use the modality specific encoders to extract your features. For example, here we are using like screen transformer using ResNet as our camera encoders, using VoxNet as our LiDAR encoder, and the computers as our radar encoder. So after this encoding step, 
The cameras the feature are still in the perspective, perspective view, while the LiDAR and radar features are in the uh, are in the uh, still in the 3D space. The nets will transform all these features in a unified bird's eye view space. So as I mentioned, the transformation process for the camera to bird's eye view is a little bit more complicated. So I will show it in the next slide. But for LiDAR radar, it's very simple. We just add the image. So once all the features have been uh, converted to the bird's eye view, we can just simply stack them together and then apply a beam encoder to uh, fuse the features together. And finally, we can apply multiple tasks, specific tasks. For example, we can attach uh, some detection, like center-based detection pad for the three object detection and some segmentation pad for the BB map segmentation. Oh, uh, so now let's uh, focus on the camera to first eye view process. So this process can be a little bit abstract. So I will uh, first provide you with an intuitive idea of how the process works. So to illustrate this transformation, so consider this street view image right, uh, of the school of engineering here I found online. So this image is captured in a camera. Uh, from the camera, we can see it's in the perspective view. So the goal of the view transformation is actually to convert this perspective view image to a top-down map view image. It's very similar to the, like the satellite image you can see here. So how can we achieve this? So the first step is we want to understand the depth of each image pixel. This is actually a very challenging task from the camera data because the camera doesn't really provide such information. So we follow the previous work to explicitly detect, predict the depth uh, distribution of each pixel. For example, for example, you can see here, like for the pixel A, it has a large um, depth pro uh, probability at a smaller depth. So indicating that this point is probably very close to the camera. While for the pixel C here, uh, it has a large um, probability va value at a larger depth. So it's probably very far away uh, from, the, from the car. So this step is essentially a depth estimation process. So we can achieve this by just applying a few convolution layers uh, to the image features. And next, we want to scatter the, uh, each of the image pixel to a few discrete points. For example, here, like we, uh, for each of the A, B, C, these three pixels, we want to scatter a four points here. So in total, we'll have 12 points after the scattering process. So the feature of these scatter points will be depending, depends on the two factors. One is the original image features here, and the other one is the best uh, distribution we just predicted. So the basic idea here is we just simply multiply these two factors together. For example, you can see the highlighted uh, box here, the 2.5 is obtained by just multiplying the corresponding image feature here, which is 5.0, and the depth distribution here, which is the uh, uh, 2.5. So this results in, a, uh, so this completes the first step of the like BV to uh, camera to BV transformation. So in practice, after the downsampling, so here we'll have around 3,000 image pixels. And for each of them, we'll generate around 100 points. And because we have six cameras in total, so that means we'll generate a super dense point cloud, around 2 million points. So that's actually like two orders of magnitude denser than the light up point cloud. So we need to keep that in mind in the next few steps because that could be an overhead. Yep. So the depth distribution you get it from in monocam that's asking? Yep, just a molecular Which one? Sorry. Which one did you use? Uh, so basically, like after the feature extraction, we just apply a few convolution layers together because we don't really need a very accurate depth estimation for this. Okay. You're not using an existing work. It's part, uh, part no. of the pipeline. We want to blend that into the original camera encoder. Oh. If we want to, if we use a separate like depth estimation module, it could actually introduce a huge overhead uh, to the, uh, on the computer side. Is there any other questions? How, how do we get the number of image features? Oh, we use a camera encoder, for example, we use a rest net to, to extract the features. And then we have like the feature for, for all of them. Right? So, okay. how did you get the number of point features uh, instead of 32? The number of point features. You mean like how many points we scattered, right? That's actually a determining. Fixed number. For example, for each pixel, we'll generate one point at, uh, like for each depth value. For example, like 0, 0 0.5 meters, 1 meter, and all the way to the 6 meters. Okay. So, like, there are like around uh, 120 points per pixel. Oh, 
what what happens when uh, you end up with two points at the, the same position? Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to handle in the next step. We want to pool, like do some pooling, right? Like for all the features actually in the same grid. So it's not, not necessarily there have, having the, exactly the same 3D coordinates, but as long as they are very close to you know, each other, want to kind of um, like aggregate their features together into one feature. Yeah, so actually before that, we want to first understand like the, the association, or actually like, like, um, like, um, like which are the points are that, that are actually close to each other. So we did a grid association here. So this is an example of the point cloud generated after the scattering step. So for each point, we have a BEV coordinates here. And also we have a feature corresponding to that. So the way we generate features is just multiplying the uh, image features and depth values. So for example, let's consider like the first uh, point here with index zero. Its coordinate is 2.8, 2.6. So that means it falls into like this uh, like blue grid. So it's a 10th grid. So you've got a BEV grid index of 10. And the same applies to this one. Uh, the coordinate is like 3.8, 2.9, so it's actually in the yellow grid here. Right? So you can do the same for the other, other like points and get a grid index here. So this can be, um, and then we want to reorder like all the entries in this table so that like all those points with the same B grid index will be consecutive with each other. So this step can be achieved by like doing an argument sort based on the uh, BV grid index, and then we we'll just reorder all the entries based on the sorted rank. So this is the table after the sorting. You can see here the point index is no longer con uh, consecutive anymore. So this is basically the rank we will get. And now look, like the steps, this step seems very simple. It's actually surprisingly slow because sorting over 2 million entries, entries using the argument sort is like a lot of computational effort. So, but there's one property we can leverage here to accelerate this process. So all the point coordinates here is actually fixed. If you think about the way it's generated, it's only based on the original camera grid in the, sorry, the original camera coordinates and the transformation between the camera to the LiDAR. So as long as the like, uh, sensors are well calibrated, for example, you, you have all the camera mounting uh, known, and also you have the LiDAR mounting uh, configuration known, then this is actually fixed. So the point uh, coordinates are fixed, and therefore the BV grid index is also fixed, and therefore the rank here is also fixed. So we don't really need to do the sorting during the inference time. We can just do that once if, uh, like beforehand to, to save, uh, store the pre-computed -pre rank. And during the inference time, we can just use the, the rank here to reorder all the entries. Um, I, I thought that the coordinate is somehow uh, derived as well from the depth of the, of the point. Because we actually generate a very dense point cloud. So actually for each of the tabs, we will generate the point. Okay. Yeah, so actually, yeah, I think you are, you are correct in some way, like that if, if you consider the, like for example, for one pixel, the one with the largest depth is actually dynamic based on the, uh, based on the depth prediction. But we're actually generating a very dense point cloud. The reason for that is we want to make sure this process is differentiable. If you generate only one point, so that means you're doing some sort of arc max uh, over all the depths uh, probability. But the arc max is not a differentiable process. So we want to use that as a like, relaxation to make it differentiable. Yeah, so this pre-computation optimization, although it's very simple, it can actually like optimize this, uh, like the latency of this step by a factor of four. So now all the points within the same BV grid will be consecutive to each other. The next step is to do some like get a reduction over all the features within the same BV grid here. So the reduction function we're using is just doing a summation. So for example, you can see here that for the first grid, uh, the feature is four. Uh, we can obtain it by one grid, right? So let's take a look at how to implement this. So aggregating the features within each BV grid is actually not very straightforward because you can um, see that different uh, BV grid can actually have different numbers of points. So the existing implementation from LSS actually uses a very clever prefix sum trick. So basically it first calculates the prefix sum uh, of the feature here. You can see we get one and four is basically one plus plus three here and 11 is four plus seven and, and so on and so forth. We first get a prefix sum vector. And then after that, we just subtract 
uh, the values at the boundaries where the indices change to obtain the reduction values within each region. So here we can get a four. Here, four is basically subtracting an imaginary zero here by the uh, from the four. And then the four here is subtracting uh, four from eight, and seven is um, uh, 15 of eight from 15. So you can compare the results uh, here and here, it's actually correct. So this is a very clever implementation because it reuses a lot of existing operators in the, for example, in the PyTorch in TensorFlow, for example, doing the triplet sum, doing the subtraction, doing the indexing. But the issue here is the triplet sum is actually not very efficient on the GPU. It requires a multi-level tree reduction to get it. But not, okay, go ahead. I thought, I thought it's, it's quite implemented like efficiently. It's, it's efficient, but if you think about it, like different outputs actually have the dependency uh, between each other, right? Yeah. If you want to get the prefix sum of the latter elements here, you need to first get the result before. So you need to do a tree reduction. So that's actually not, so it's not as efficient as, for example, just doing a sum. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And also, if you think about it here, there are a lot of unnecessary elements generated because what we only care about here is those prefix sum values at the boundary. So we're actually generating all of them just to support us to get all the pre like the prefix sums at the boundary that we care about. <laughs> so the way we accelerate it is also very simple. So we just write a specialized CUDA kernel. So the basic idea is we assign a GPU thread to each of the grid. And then within each grid, we just do an in interval reduction and then write it back to the, to the GPU. So it's very simple. But it turns out it's actually very effective because it, um, removes the dependency between different uh, output values. And also it does not uh, require these like unnecessary value computation, right? So this optimization step can accelerate the whole process by a factor of 250. The initial camera to bird's eye view transformation step took around like 500 milliseconds here. With the interval reduction, it can be accelerated by a factor of 22 times. And then further with the pre-computation, this step is optimized by another uh, factor of two. So you can see originally, like for the view transformation, so the right hand side is the end to end breakdown, latency breakdown of the BV fusion model. So 83% of the total runtime is actually spent on the view transformation process, a clear bottleneck. But with the, uh, with the optimization, we can reduce this part to only 12%, uh, achieving a five times end to end speed up. So this improvement is actually very crucial because if we want to unify the multiple sensory into a like unified DV space, this uh, transformation is actually a, a key operator to, 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 to achieve this. So now let's move on to the evaluation part. So here's a demo of the BV fusion running on the new things for the uh, 3D object detection for the BV map simulation. So you can see that like the BV fusion is able to recognize different objects fairly accurately, even though they far away objects. And also the map simulation result is also fairly good. Although you can see some blurry like before the intersection, but that's mostly because we don't really have the information at that region. There's some occlusion and a limited sensor coverage uh, in some regions, for example, you can see the, the top right uh, corner of this intersection. Then let's take a look at the quantitative, uh, quantitative results of the 3D object detection on the new things. So there are a lot of numbers here. <laughs> Before looking at the numbers, let's first take a look at the metrics that we care about. So first is the modality, basically which sensor, what, what are the sensory like inputs uh, the, mod, the method uses. And then the next here is the number of facts and the latency. So the, these two are the efficiency measures of the model. So the number of facts is a power of metric measures basically counting the number of multiply ads in the model. And the latency is measured on uh, RTX 3090 GPU. And the rest four here is the MAP NDS on both validation and test set. The MAP is the 3D object detection accuracy. And the NDS is an aggregated detection score defined by new things uh, lead of work. So it's kind of, it also uh, cares, about, cares about some other factors like attribute estimation and also the velocity estimation. So let's first take a look at the camera only baselines and the light only baselines. So one thing we can clearly see is that uh, accuracy between uh, accuracy of the LIDAR only baseline detectors are much higher than the camera only baselines. So the reason for that is the three detection is a task 
cares about the geometry of the scene and objects. You can directly get an accurate spatial like estimation from the LiDAR sensors. Well, for the camera sensor, it's actually very hard to get the spatial estimation, the depth estimation. So that's why there's a huge gap here. And then let's take a look at the sensor fusion um, methods. So we compare with a few representative sensor fusion methods, the point painting we have just introduced, and some others like MAP, Jupiter 3D uh, sensor fusion. The one thing we can clearly see here is the uh, sensor fusion method typically is more expensive, computationally expensive compared with the LiDAR only. For example, you can see here the Jupiter 3D uses like uh, one T max. Well, for the center uh, point, the line only center point is only like 150 uh, Gmax. In comparison, our BV Fusion is able to achieve the state-of-the-art performance while like actually being much, uh, at least like 1.5 to two times uh, more efficient than those uh, baselines. And another, another thing we can see here is compared to line only baselines, the Fusion method like BV Fusion, right? It achieves a very high accuracy a uh, large accuracy improvement around like 10% um, on the validation set and more than 10%, uh, around 10% on the uh, test set as well. So we want to understand where these uh, improvements actually come from. So here we study some, like the performance of uh, our beef fusion, the LIDAR only baselines, the baseline sensor data masses, and their different object sizes and object distances. But one thing we can clearly see here on the left hand side is that the BV fusion achieves a very consistent improvement over the LiDAR only models across different, uh, across different object sizes. While for the MVP, it only achieves a good uh, improvement for the smaller objects, but for the larger objects, the, the improvement is actually very marked. Oh, sorry, the other side. Uh, the achieve a large improve, improvement for the larger objects, but for the smaller objects, the improvement is actually very, very marginal. And also from the right hand side, we can see compared with the LiDAR only method, our BV fusion achieves a much larger improvement for those objects uh, that are very far away, distant away from the, from the Eagle car. That actually makes sense because the LiDAR has a very limited coverage, range coverage. So that's something can be improved by the, by the like, dense camera information. So we can actually bring a much larger improvement for this case. And then let's take a look at the uh, results of the BV map segmentation. So that's same here. We first take a look at the metrics. We only we care about the mean IOU here, and also the per class IOU scores for uh, all these different semantic classes. And the camera only baseline, the light only baseline. So we actually have a better camera only baseline already. The BV Fusion C is a camera only version of our BV Fusion. It already achieves at least 12% higher MIOU compared with the previous camera only baselines. Well, one thing that's very interesting here is you can see the LiDAR only method performs much worse than the camera only models. That's directly the opposite from what we have just observed on the three object. So the reason for this is that this task is more about the semantics rather than about ge geometry. So this is actually what, this type of information is what the camera can help the most. And then finally the fusion results. So, Compared with the base science, the point painting and DP, they mostly just care about the objects. So that's why they don't really have much improvement compared with the line only base line here. Very marginal improvement around like 0.5%. While BB Fusion achieves a much larger improvement, around 6% uh, over the strong camera only uh, base line here. All right, so that's enough for the numbers for now. So let's, uh, let's take a look at our uh, the, how robust our fusion model is to different um, lighting and different weather conditions. So because of the limitation of the new scenes data set, we can only test uh, the performance under the nighttime, and daytime, and the rainy days and the sunny days. So let's first take a look at the lighting robustness. So poor lighting conditions are very challenging for the camera only models because camera provides less information during the night. So the camera only LSS, so the camera only based on here, uh, performs much worse during the nighttime. It actually has a 25%, at least 25% MLU degradation. While with the fusion, with our fusion, the BV fusion can significantly boost the performance by about 
uh, which is the improvement is actually even larger than what we got for the daytime. So this actually demonstrates the significance of the geometric groups when the sensor camera sensor failed. And this is the visualization of the camera only places during nighttime. You can see it cannot up, like, recognize the objects, like the far away objects here, and also the segmentation quality is fairly uh, cool. Uh, for our DD tuition, it's able to recognize much more objects on the, on the data, and also the segmentation quality is much better. And then let's take a look at the results in the different weather conditions. So, detecting objects in the rainy weather could be challenging for the LiDAR only method because of the like the sensor noises during the during rainy days. So the LiDAR only detector central point here you can see it has a right uh, four percent accuracy drop compared with the results during the day, uh, sunny days. Otherwise, the beam diffusion you can see uh, it improves the central point by ten point seven percent, actually achieving slightly better accuracy than the sunny days here. So this is because the, the camera is actually very robust to different lighting conditions. So adding this information to the fusion model can help a lot. So some visualizations here as well. So this is the line only baseline. Uh, the segmentation result is fairly very, uh, fairly very blurry. And this is our result. So you can see the lane dividers are much clearer here. And also, we studied some effectiveness of our BV fusion under like sparser LIDARs. So the reason why this setting is very interesting is the sparser LIDARs are usually cheaper. So it can be actually deployed, like more deployable or affordable on the cars. So for example, a four beam LIDAR consumes uh, around a thousand dollars, while for the higher end of like uh, LIDARs, they can be much more expensive. So BV fusion brings a much larger improvement for the partial light for example, for the one beam light up here. The improvement is around 12% compared to the It makes sense because the light is very sparse, right? The point painting or point decoration will drop almost all the camera features, which is clearly not optimal. And radars can be seen as a sparser variant of the light So we also did some analysis on the radar, uh, camera radar fusion as well. So here the baselines are the center fusion, the future is really, and the very recently, a recent result called prepped. So you can see that compared with these baselines, the BV fusion can at least deliver the same detection accuracy, which is the uh, MAP here, and achieving much better graph velocity estimation. So here the MAB is the mean average velocity as arrow. So it's the lower the better. And the NDS uh, is the aggregated scores. So you can see like the BV fusion can achieve this result with at least three times faster compared with the baselines. And recently we also tried to accelerate this model using TensorRT. We can achieve around 40 like, frames per second using this like, the same model. And finally, let's take a look at some readable results. So BV fusion ranked first on the using 3D object detection uh, as of last summer. So as I mentioned earlier, like this is a very fast evolving direction. So there have been a lot of works coming on the leaderboard like, uh, in the past one year. But some of them are actually using very similar approaches uh, as BV Fusion, some follow-up works. And BV Fusion also ranked first on the using 3D object tracking benchmark. So tracking is one step further than the detection. So we not only want to detect those objects, we also want to associate the same objects across different frames. So this is actually very necessary for like doing motion prediction, like even the, in the later planning series, it's also very crucial. And also on the Wismo 3D object detection benchmark, our robust uh, benchmark. And we have open sourced the code of our DNA diffusion uh, on the GitHub. So it has received like 1,000 uh, 1, stars since its release. And feel free to check it out if you're interested. So that concludes the first part about the beam diffusion. So there are two main key takeaways here. First, the bird's eye view space is actually an ideal space uh, for the multi-task multi-sensor fusion. And secondly, the view transformation actually plays a crucial role in terms of the efficiency and should be properly accelerated. And before we uh, move on to the next part, I would like to pause a little bit to, to take some questions you may have. I just have a question on the um, prefix sum part. Okay. Um, so, so if you if you write a kernel for each cell, basically, right, for each cell, mm -hmm. then you have to make the cells equal length, right? 
I love that equal length. Okay. So you be able to run the purpose. It doesn't have to be. Like some threads might like finish the job early. So if you, so if you, if you run, if you push all of them to the, to the GPU, you, you have to concatenate zeros when they're, they're not equal. Uh, you don't have to. You just need to mark the starting and ending position of each uh, interval. And then you can just assign the workflow to like, each GPU thread. So for some GPU thread, like their workflow might be lighter so we can finish like, earlier. But uh, it's, it's also fine. So it's kind of bottomed back by the interval that has the heaviest workflow. Yeah, so, so if you, even if they, if they finish earlier, they will still wait until the, the, the last one finish. Uh, that's kind of right. But like there, there are some other like optimizations we can do here. For example, if it's, it's highly imbalanced, right? We can kind of group some of the oh so uh, you can push this one to this part, this one to this part. But we haven't done that because like in reality, like the actually it's fairly it's like really equal. equally distributed. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Um so just uh, in general, what are the outputs of, of these different types of models? Uh, this so, is the final. Yeah. So the output is like the detection and the data map segmentation. Okay. So, um, yeah, probably this one. So for the detection, you just generate a 3D box. So for each box, you have the 3D uh, positions, X, Y, Z. They have WHL for the 3D sizes, they have the orientation, the hiding of orientation, and also have the velocity prediction. For the PD map segmentation, it's basically generating a multi multi class uh, like prediction for each of the pixels here. For example, for each of the pixels here, we'll generate a probability vector uh, over, like, let's say, 10 different classes and uh, one for each uh, semantic class. Wow. How do you know the um, the velocity of the objects? Are you combining multiple frames together from, from, from the sensors or is that fusion happening in a separate? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. You can, you can, you can see here, DB that it's a camera only model. So you can see it's velocity estimation error is very large. So the unit here is like a centimeter per second. So it's like one meter per second error. Like it's a very large. Um, Error because it's a single frame model, so you cannot really estimate the velocity uh, from the single frame camera model. It's basically guessing uh, the velocity based on the pass. Uh, the radar can directly provide uh, the velocity estimation. But for the camera lidar, camera lidar fusion models, because we usually use like a 10 frame lidar aggregation, so we'll map the lidar point of the previous frames and transform it into a current point system and, and just like, fuse them together. So we'll also have the information for that. So one thing we can see here. Uh, oh, that's, okay. That, that was the reason why you have this uh, car image with the red dots. There are multiple red dots for each beam. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can also see here, there's a trace here, like behind the top. It, when it's not moving, you cannot see it, right? But as long as it's moving, you can see it. <laughs> yeah, I see it. Yeah, because you know, there's a trace here, right? That's because we're aggregating the data Point cloud from multiple frames together. Mm -hmm. But if it's not moving, then you're actually stacking the same point cloud over and over. Right. Are there any other questions? How long does it train from end to end? Uh, the training pipeline is actually a little bit complicated. We need to first uh, pre train the camera encoders, and then we pre train the light on wave model, and then like fuse them together. So the camera model is also like. These are uh, like a few steps of the training because if you want to get a good result on a leaderboard, you usually need to like use <laughs> there's a lot of like complicated training tricks, like first per train on the image net and you know, on the Coco and you know, on the new, new image. Oh, really? Because of all that, yeah, a lot of steps in order to get a good result. But like, uh, I don't think this actually matters if you have a larger data set. So I would say, like, in general, if I you mean, want, this new, new things is already really large <laughs> because I mean, I guess it's not that large. It's it's larger than some like data set, but like for example, it's kind of smaller than the than the yeah than the Weibo. Yeah, the Weibo data set. So we have to go through all these training stages. Oh, okay. But like 
in theory, I don't think these actually matter as much as long as you have a larger data set. I know, I know, but like from a researcher point of view, I, I need to, we need to know how long it drink. So in total, I would say two to three days on um, eight GPUs. Eight GPUs. Yeah. Okay. Are all the intermediate models uh, fully convolutional, uh, or are there uh, model parts of the models? Are they uh, do they have other architectures in them? Yeah, let's go back to this. <clears throat> yeah, so for the so for the camera encoder here, we are using mainly using extreme transformer. But for the camera radar fusion, because that will be targeted deployment, so we're using rest. The swing transformers are harder to, to deploy. And for the LiDAR encoder here, we're using a voxel net. I will explain what this voxel net is. It's basically a model composing of composed with like sparse convolutions. Mm -hmm. And then the radar encoder here is the point pivot, so basically a few MLPs on each point. Of, uh, sorry, on each of the point. And uh, the BV encoder is just a convolutional neural network. Mm -hmm. um, the other parts, I don't think yeah, they're they're mostly mostly like non non -derived, So, so in principle, nobody, if someone wanted to retrain your BV, they wouldn't have to. Retrain a new model from scratch. They could use your your weights. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah exactly. It, especially we have actually released the camera retraining weights, retraining weights, and also the lineup retrainers, so you can directly reuse. Them. Yeah. Right. Then let's move forward to the second final. Oh, sure. um, sorry. So I have a kind of a amateur question, which is. For this bird's eye view fusion, what about thinking about the case that the car is driving on the road, which is have a drastic change of raw and pitch channel? Is this also works in your algorithms? Because most of the intensities you're using in the size are just the city cases mm -hmm. where lots of cars, but actually the road, the road is just a plane. Yes, yeah, so what about this 3D kind of? Yeah, there's the allegation change. Yes, like that, right? Yes. Yeah, that's okay.